had been working on the subject for about 43 years before John Hornichberger introduced homeopathy to India in 1939. And it was just the next year, 1840, when uh, Dr Stephen Simpson arrived in Sydney from London. He was probably the first homeopath in Australia. He'd encountered homeopathy in Europe in the 1820s and practised for a while in Rome before attempting to set up a practice in London in 1836. After six months in Sydney, during which his wife died, Simpson moved to Queensland where he practised for only a couple of years before being appointed the Commissioner for Crown Lands and later also a magistrate, eventually being known as the most respected man in, in that Queensland colony. In considering this change of professions, we should recall that Constantine Herring, who was a, a pioneering in, uh, American homeopath, started his practice in Philadelphia in 1833. Slavery was abolished in Britain and its colonies in that same year. And it was in 1846 when Berninghausen's therapeutic pocketbook was first published, and that became the most practical and widely used bedside homeopathic reference. And it was not until 1862 that the first homeopathic pharmacy was opened in Queensland. Consequently, practising homeopathy there in the early 1840s would have been a difficult task. With only Hahnemann's Materia Medica and possibly an early edition of the organ on to guide you, if you actually had editions in a language you could read. And if you decided on a remedy to give the patient, well, either you had it already, or you had to get some raw material from which to make it, or you might have to wait months before you could obtain it. I imagine that being a respected public servant was a much more attractive proposition. During the next 20 years, knowledge and use of homeopathy increased in Australia, and by 1860 there were dispensaries, plus or minus practitioners, established in Sydney, Hobart, Melbourne, Adelaide and Tanunda in South Australia and New Norcia, a, a bit north of Perth, in Western Australia. Next I'll focus on William Moore, who started practising homeopathy on animals in England, having been brought up on a farm. He also studied medicine, but not in any formal course before arriving in Sydney in 1857 and moving to Goulburn the next year. He toured around surrounding towns such as Queen Bean and Yass, providing consultations. Five years later, he moved to West Maitland, which uh, is, is uh, sort of northwest of Sydney, joining into a practice partnership that lasted until 1869 when he returned to Sydney. In 1873, he wrote letters to the Sydney Morning Herald protesting against the Medical Board of New South Wales attempts to restrict medical practice to the members of that board, arguing that the public should have the right to choose their own medical therapies. Sounds rather familiar. An excerpt from those letters. The Medical Board of New South Wales have now a good share of protection already, and yet they want to suppress a few practitioners who are more successful than themselves. Despite his various practice moves, he was probably a very success, a successful practitioner as he came to own substantial land and a successful manufacturing facility for his herbal-homeopathic ointments. By 1898, he was living in Lawson, that's up in the Blue Mountains, where he died in 1911, leaving funds in trust for various Christian organisations and also the Sydney Homeopathic Hospital. This trust continues to support an outpatient clinic at Balmain Hospital, of which I'm the current director. Going back to 1863, Dr William Sherwin was the first Australian-born medical practitioner to advertise that he practised homeopathy. But this was in the latter part of his career and he died in 1874. In 1876, now, now we'll get on to some history of homeopathic hospitals in Australia. In 1876, the first homeopathic hospital was opened in Melbourne, 
After seven years of discussion and planning, it was initially a three-storey terraced house until a purpose-built hospital was completed in 1885 and subsequently expanded. Homeopathy continued there until 1936 when Dr. William Booten died after 51 years of service. In 1879, the Adelaide Children's Hospital was established and half of its six medical staff were homeopaths. In 1899, the Hobart Homeopathic Hospital was established and continued till 1932. And from 1900 to 1946, Launceston also had a homeopathic hospital tended to by Dr. Philip Smith for 46 years. In 1902, a homeopathic hospital was founded in Redfern in Sydney and moved to Glebe in 1915. Homeopathic services continued there until 1945 in the hands of the matron after Dr. Lee Deck had retired in 1941. This expansion and subsequent contraction of homeopathy can be explained by the fact that from 1880, the British Medical Association uh, took over or certainly significantly influenced its Australian counterparts, which became biased against foreign doctors, such as European and American, where homeopathy had a stronger following. And they were opposing unorthodox practices, such as homeopathy. Medical science had also evolved beyond bleeding febrile patients. The homeopathic hospitals could no longer attract medical staff to support them and so some of them continued in name but not in practice. Since the 1970s, there has been a resurgence of interest in homeopathy with the formation of the following organisations. The Australian Institute of Homeopathy was formed in New South Wales in 1946 and it took until 1973 to establish its first professional course, which was at the Nature Care College. From then to 1999, homeopathy was taught by various individuals and institutions around the country, disseminating a variety of attitudes and methodologies of practice. The Australian Homeopathic Association had its beginnings in 1982 in South Australia, becoming a national organisation the following year. And uh, it had the name of the Australian Federation of Homeopaths from 1988 to 1995. In Melbourne, the Homeopathic Education and Research Association was formed in 1983, and it's maintained an educational in influence from India from the Institute of Clinical Research. And the Australian Association of Professional Homeopaths was formed in Queensland during that period, with a few chiropractors prominent in its membership. The Australian Medical Faculty of Homeopathy had its origins in the early 1980s, led by Dr. Eric Asher, who had been influenced by Dr. John Geats, who was a UK immigrant who'd been practicing in Sydney for several decades. It recognised the MF HOM exam, a UK exam, and some of its members, such as myself, studied in London, but others were taught in Sydney and utilised an occasional visiting examiner from the United Kingdom. An effort to developed training standards for homeopaths with the help of the Australian National Training Authority, brought together these various, well, brought together various personalities from these professional associations in an at times frustrating process lasting a couple of years, which culminated in 1999 with the federal government endorsing the product of that work as the national competency standards for homeopathy. Julia Twi Twiwig from Adelaide and Michael Tomlinson from Melbourne were primarily responsible for holding this effort together and leading on to the formation of the Australian Register of Homeopaths, separating the registration body from the professional associations in order to maintain these standards on registrants and to regulate the training organisations that train students to these standards. However, there remains no legal requirement for a homeopath to be a member of a professional association, nor to be registered. Although over the last decade, there has been put in, in place a code of ethics in each state to which health practitioners may be held to account. 
legally. Also, over the last decade, certain members of the medical profession have increasingly antagonised complementary therapies, and since 2011, this has been under the guise of the Friends of Science in Medicine. Homeopathy has been one of their targets. By infiltrating and influencing other organisations, they have inhibited homeopathy courses being established in universities, and they've uh, made it more and more difficult to get uh, um, practice insurance, uh, for doctors at least. The National Health and Medical Research Council's report on homeopathy released in 2015 has been particularly damaging to homeopathy's reputation in Australia and overseas, compounding the obstacles for establishing courses and resulting in the recent removal of health insurance coverage for homeopathy. Concurrently, there has been some migration of practitioners from the approximate, let's say, 250,000 registered Indian homeopaths, which has been a ferment for education, research and development there, and hopefully GHF will provide an avenue for support and some hope for the future. And that's my 10 or 15 minutes. <laughs>